Hi, this is Mary Travers, and you're listening to Mary Travers and Friend. And today's guest is Bob Dylan. We're here in the studio with Bob, and there are a lot of good musical questions to talk about. First, I'd like to, to talk a little bit about some of the folks that the two of us were listening to uh, in the early 60s. Uh, people like Woody Guthrie. Um, and let's... Uh, what about Guthrie? Did you ever meet him? Yes, I did. I met him. Was well, he very uh, sick then? Or he was, was he? Well, I did meet him in his, uh, you know, in his prime time, I guess. But uh, when I met him, he was pretty laid up. But uh, he was still alive and alert. I made many visits out to see him in uh, the hospital. Right, he had Huntington's career, which is... Uh, kind of a shaky thing, you know. You've uh, done an album that isn't released yet called Basement Tapes. You want to tell me about that? That was recorded in... Uh, 60, 66, 67 up in Woodstock, before the big Woodstock festival, before Woodstock was uh, discovered, exploited. We were just all up there sort of drying out. You and the band? Yeah, and... members of the band and uh, various other people up there making music and planting gardens and uh, just watching time go by. And so in the meantime, we made this record. Actually, it wasn't a record. It was just songs, which we'd come, you know, to uh, this basement and and uh, record out in the woods. That's basically it, really. The record's been uh, exposed throughout the years, so somebody mentioned it was a good idea to put it out, you know, as a record, so people could hear it you know, in its entirety and just exactly what we were doing up there in those years. And it'll be out shortly. You want to play a track off of it? We can play all the tracks. Okay, let's play one track now and play some more later. Do you think that that period was uh, a good period, a good period to hang out and kind of relax and get back to what music was about for you? For me? Well, well in, What do you mean? In the sense that um, when you're on tour and you're working hard, I know, I find, I mean, I write poetry. I don't write songs. Uh, I find it very difficult to write on the road. Uh, between getting on and off a plane and bad food and checking right. in the holiday in, it leaves you very, it saps you of, of the kind of contemplative time you need to sit around and really think. And you also don't play so much together. Yeah, well, these yeah. songs basically on that tape, they were written like in five, ten minutes. You know, we had just come off of a ferocious tour, you know, Australia and Europe, England. These were more needed, for fun. Yeah, need, needed some time, you know, to uh, let it all, uh, you know, let the... The dust settle. Let the dust settle and the waves come in, you know. Well, I think a, a lot of people go through periods like that. that they need, need to oh. have... If you forget how to have fun with music, you've just destroyed it for yourself. You know, I think, unfortunately, that's what heavy touring often does to us all. You know, you, it becomes a job. It becomes a business. And perhaps that's kind of the genesis of the basement tapes, is to go back and have fun with music. In a sense, this is a kind of a retrospective album uh, for you. And you've had some funny albums in the sense that... Well, I take that back, not funny albums, but... Most people do albums because the record company says you got to do X number of albums a year. And then when you get tired, or I get tired, and it's happened to me too, you throw out a best of and uh, kind of hang around and try to figure out what it is you really want to say musically. Uh, musically, uh, I play and whatever comes out, comes out. I don't play on albums. All that pressure is off. I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't have to go in and make an album every six months. Uh, I don't think of it that way. I just continue to play my guitar, and uh, you know, if there's a song in my heart to do, I'll do. Let's maybe go back to, to Guthrie and see if we can't explore that a little bit more. He obviously had a great, you know, effect on on your music, and on a great many. I, writers of that period, and, and you can see his influence even 
even now. I mean, the talking blues form, I think, is a very viable and will always be viable form of, of saying something. And he wrote songs like Pastures of Plenty and This Land is Your Land. Those songs, you know, most mm -hmm. people know. Mm -hmm. and there are many songs that are not as familiar. But he was also a very social writer and cared very much and came from a time of, of uh, when many artists were very involved and in caring about the country and what was happening to it. And I suppose Peter, Paul, and Mary, and Pete Seeger, and the Weavers, and yourself even, were caught up in that social commentary way of, of talking, of, of viewing the world as we saw it at that time. There were certainly a lot of your songs that were like that. Do you feel that that's not a reasonable position to take now, or is it just that you're caring about other things? No, it's a very reasonable position to take now. It's just a, you know, it's just hard to be specific about, you know, what we're even talking about here. Uh, let alone try to write a song or do a play or make some kind of art, art form out of uh, these big situations which are happening in the world, which are changing so fast now. So yeah. From day to day, I mean, it's like uh, they're just rolling over too fast to keep your eye on. Whereas uh, back then when uh, Woody was doing all, all his writing, the, you know, the media wasn't so powerful. Well, and it also took longer to get something changed. It took longer to get anywhere. You know, it took longer to get from here to there. I guess what you're saying really is that it presents a special kind of problem for people who want to write that kind of material. Well, it can be confusing, you know, if, if you want to write uh, what they call topical songs. It's hard to find the frontier. You wrote a lot of good topical songs. Of course, uh, well, I, I wrote, say that... For I wrote those songs, though, before it was happening. And... Uh, before everybody's on your case, you know? Mm -hmm. Everybody gets on your case, you just don't want to do it anymore. You know, it's like anything else. People tell you, you know, you don't want me to do what you're told to do. It's, it's uh, discouraging. Plus, you're just running over the same... Uh, same ground. Yeah. I mean, you've said it. I mean, I yeah. don't think you have to say, times are changing twice. Right. Say it again, say it again. You know, that's what they want. You know? Yeah, what they want. Did you ever meet Nina Simone? I met her at a, a table once somewhere, in a club. Yeah, she did a couple of your tunes. Yeah. And well, I thought. Yeah. I thought she brought something. Roberta Flack did uh, Just Like a Woman. Yeah. But uh, she got the words wrong, you know? She changed the words. I don't think she changed them. I think she uh, just got them wrong. Well, I know Nina Simone did Just Like a Woman as well. I think she makes a lyric change there. Yeah. As Personally, I, I don't understand why anybody would want to do that song, except me. Richie Havens did it? Uh, Richie, yeah, it made sense coming from Richie. Let's play Richie. Yeah. I like Richie. When you say I like Richie, that's that's not true. I it's love a, it's his an work. Understatement, yeah. Yeah. I love his work. I love him as a human being. Yeah. I love him as a musician. And he's like a king. Okay, let's talk about the present. Since we can't talk about the future. Since it doesn't exist yet. And the future right now is this well, it all exists, you know. The present exists, the past exists, and the future exists. It all exists. How do you see the future as existing? It exists as part of the present. The Zen, Zen philosophy, I think it's Zen philosophy. I mean, you just live in the present, you know. But that statement is more complicated than uh, meets the eye, really. Or meets the ear. But it's all the same. The past, the present, and the future. Historically, it would seem so. I think we might be crossing a line here that... Uh, okay, we'll drop that. Okay, that's fine. Uh, Those questions are philosophic questions. And the program really isn't about philosophy, per se. Right. It's about music. Although there's a lot of philosophy, certainly, in music. And a lot in yours, which is self-evident. That philosophy in my music, I have to admit, is accidental. You really think so? Yeah, none of it is really preconceived. I can tell you that much. Well, when you say preconceived, now I know when I write something, when I write a poem, I don't sit around all day saying, gee, I'd like to write a poem about flowers or, or children or caring about people. I mean, I don't think about what it is I'm going to write about. I mean, when you feel like writing, you sit down and out some, something pops. But it doesn't mean that you haven't been thinking about it. Yeah, that gets back to thinking again, you know. My stuff has to do more with feeling than thinking. Okay. 
When I get to thinking, I, I'm usually in some kind of trouble. Well, feeling is often, if you can trust your, your own feelings, you're probably in better shape. It's a more truthful. Oh, yeah. Comes down to mutual trust. Always. On Blood on the Tracks, needless to say, I loved the, the album. I really enjoyed the album. And felt that you, it was funny because when we had talked before, we talked about yeah. the recording processes and how when they get very complex, uh, much of the truth of a piece of music is lost. It becomes something else. And one of the things I enjoyed about Blood on the Tracks as an album was that it was very simple. That's the way things are, really. They're, they are basically very simple. But a lot of people tell me they enjoyed that album. I, I, it's, it's hard for me to relate to that. I mean, the people were enjoying the type of pain, you know? It is a painful album. Well, perhaps maybe the word enjoy is the wrong word. Maybe a better word is to say that you're moved. I was moved by the album. You know, there were things that I could relate to in mm -hmm. that album that Good. made sense to me. You made sense to me. Let's play If You See Her Say Hello, because I think that's a very beautiful song. Very pertinent. For me, that it was a very poignant song and a very sad song. But together, one of the things I like about your work is that even when you're feeling bad, it isn't self-pity bad. It's just, I don't feel good. Mm-hmm. Even when you're feeling down, you feel up. Well, you're feeling something, and that's the positive, as opposed to uh, feeling destroyed by it. Do you write songs? No. I'm writing a book. Mm -hmm. I write a lot of poetry, but somehow I've never been able to figure out how to make poems into songs. It's just, uh, it really seems to be a different way of writing. Yeah, it's confining. What, songs? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, well, poetry seems to give you a, a bigger canvas to play with, and you don't have to explain it the same way. Songs seem to have to be understandable. Somehow in a poem you can ramble and deal with several thoughts and and not have to necessarily connect them, the images. I know a, a song of yours that I think, for me, was most poem lot was Hard Rain's Gonna Fall. Because it really wasn't a song, it was a series of images. And when you see it on a piece of paper, it really looked like a poem. Play Leon's version, he did it okay. too. Okay. The In Concert album that you did with the band on the last tour, which was a incredible piece of business for someone who doesn't do a lot of concerts. You sure made up for it with that tour. Mm. I'd like to play something off of that album. Mm -hmm. Was there something that you felt went well? Oh, uh, you play All Along the Watchtower. Finish up with uh, a track from the Basement Tapes. Uh, your choice. Uh, okay. Yeah. Oh, Apple Suckling Tree. Okay, we'll, we'll finish with that. Yeah. And thank you. This is KNX-FM, Los Angeles.